Hello, my beautiful biologists. It's time for another biology with Miss Judd. So far in this unit, we've talked about the basic idea of evolution. Just recently, we looked at the fact that there is evidence that evolution exists on this planet. Population and species have changed over time. We saw that with evidence from the fossil record, with evidence from our structures, with evidence from biochemistry. When we think of evolution, we think of the scientist Charles Darwin. In the 1850s, Darwin wrote a very influential book called On the Origin of Species. In this book, he proposed that species evolved, or as he said, descended with modification, and that all living species can trace their descent to a common ancestor. But more than that, Darwin suggested a mechanism for this evolution. He said that this evolution happens because of natural selection. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about these heritable traits that help organisms survive and reproduce, and therefore they become more common in a population over time. So because these traits are becoming more common, my population is going to change. Sounds like we need to talk to Ghost Miss Judd. Hello, biologists, and welcome to Unit 6, Lesson 2, Natural Selection. This idea of natural selection came from our friend Charles Darwin. Darwin seemed like an unlikely revolutionary, but he was offered a chance to work as an unpaid naturalist on the boat HMS Beagle, a naval vessel that was going around South America. Darwin took advantage of this opportunity and looked at the Galapagos Islands more specifically. He observed plant and animal life and collected both living and fossilized specimens to study later. Based on all of these observations, he came up with the origin of species. On the origin of species may have never been written, let alone published if it wasn't for the other scientists that we talked about. In this book, Darwin wrote that evolution is due to two natural factors. The first factor, Darwin argued, is that each individual animal is marked by subtle differences that distinguish it from its parents. Darwin called these differences variations or, as we know, genetic mutations. The second factor, Darwin argued, is that although variations are random, some of them have advantages superior camouflage, greater speed, are good examples. But this allows this organism to survive in its environment. With a greater chance of survival means there's more opportunity to breed and pass on those traits to more offspring. Over time, an advantage spreads throughout a species. And because of that, the species is more likely to endure and reproduce. There we go. Over many generations, these small changes occur, they build, and eventually it becomes bigger changes and possibly even new species. This is his theory of natural selection. Now we want to remember that this idea of evolution occurs at the population level, not the individuals. Think back to our organization of life. It is the group of organisms that are changing, not just one. Darwin gave us three main forces to this principle of natural selection. The first one is a struggle for existence. Organisms produce more offspring than the environment can support. If all populations have the potential to produce more offspring than can survive, members of a population will compete for the resources. Darwin described this competition as a struggle for existence. There's competition for those resources. So here I have a population, a group of butterflies. There are limited resources like a lack of food, a lack of habitat, and a lack of mates, which means that not all individuals are going to survive. So then there's the question, if not all individuals are going to survive, who's going to? And that brings us to our second factor, variation and adaptation. Here's where natural and heritable variation took center stage. Darwin hypothesized that individuals with certain types of inherited variation are better suited or adapted to life in their environment than other individuals. Members of a predatory species that are faster or have longer claws or sharper teeth can catch more prey. And members of a prey species that are faster and better camouflage can avoid being caught. 
So the offspring in any generation will be slightly different from one another in their traits, color, size, shape, speed. And then these traits are inheritable. We're thinking about our genetics knowledge. They get passed on to offspring. Any heritable characteristic that increases an organism's ability to survive and reproduce is it called an adaptation. Adaptations involve body parts or structures like a tiger's claws. Some adaptations are physiological, the way the plant carries out photosynthesis. It's how the organism is built. A lot of adaptations involve behaviors such as social behavior and avoidance of predators. As long as it increases the organism ability to survive and reproduce in its environment. In our butterfly population, we have different variations. We have red and we have blue. Remember, butterflies do not actually talk. This is a cartoon, cute illustration purposes only. This variation depends on its environment. Now, those that are best for its environment are considered fit. Darwin, like Lamarck, recognized that there would be a connection between the way an organism and its environment interact. According to Darwin, differences in adaptation affect an individual's fitness. We define fitness as how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment. Individuals with adaptations that are well-suited to their environment can survive and reproduce and are said to have a high fitness. If the characteristics are not well-suited for their environment, that means they're not going to survive. They're going to die without reproducing, and they're going to leave relatively few offspring, and they're said to have low fitness. This results in some sort of differential reproductive success. That's survival of the fittest. Now note, survival here means more than just staying alive. In evolutionary terms, survival means surviving, reproducing, and passing adaptations on to the next generation. So here, my butterfly population exists on a red tree. Some are going to survive more than others. More specifically, those that are more red are going to survive more than the ones that are blue. Because my bird here is more likely to see the blue, which means it's more likely to eat the blue, which means those blue butterflies are not surviving. They are not reproducing. The traits getting passed on are the red butterfly traits. Natural selection is the process by which organisms in nature with variations most suited to their local environment survive and leave more offspring. That's what Darwin named his mechanism for. The environment influences that fitness. Natural selection occurs in any situation in which more individuals are born than could survive, the struggle for existence, Natural heritable variation affects the ability to survive and reproduce, variation and adaptation, and fitness varies among individuals, that differential reproductive success. As more birds eat the blue butterflies off the red tree, that means that the ones surviving are the red butterflies. The ones reproducing are the red butterflies, which means that over time, the traits getting passed on are the red traits which means that over time, my population is going to become more red. And that's evolution by natural selection. Apply this to a different situation. There are two types of worms, worms that eat at night, they're called nocturnal, and worms that eat during the day, they're called diurnal. The worms that eat during the day seem to be eating only the diurnal worms. The nocturnal worms are in their burrows during this time. Each spring when the worms reproduce, they have about 500 babies, but only 100 of these 500 ever become old enough to reproduce. So let's take Darwin's ideas of natural selection and apply it to this situation. First is that struggle of existence. For this struggle, 500 babies were born, but only 100 reproduce and survive, which means that there's got to be some who don't. So my struggle for existence is that only 100 worms survive from the 500 born. That means that there's got to be some differences between these worms that allow them to survive. The variation in adaptation is that some worms are diurnal and some worms are nocturnal. 
the ones that get eaten are the diurnal worms by the birds, which means the most fit, the worms that are surviving and reproducing are the nocturnal worms. The nocturnal worms survive and reproduce, which means that over time, the population of worms becomes more nocturnal. And that's evolution by natural selection. Let's pause here and do the next one on our own. From generation to generation, populations continue to change as they become better adapted or as the environment changes. Now, something to really think about is that natural selection does not make organisms better. Adaptations don't have to be perfect. They have to be just good enough to enable an organism to pass its genes onto the next generation. Remember, natural selection does not make organisms better, but it does change populations, and it changes it in three ways. There are three types of natural selections. Now, when we look at this, we're going to be looking at graphs. Our graphs are going to show a range of the trait. So our original population has a nice bell curve, which means most individuals are in the average or in the middle. So most individuals are average height. Most individuals have an average color. But we're going to see how the environment could affect these, at, these traits. So our first one, if we have our average, but if the population is selected against one extreme, those individuals are going to die, which means it's going to select for the other extreme, which means I have a new population where the average had shifted. So let's write this on our graph in our notes. It selects for one extreme and against the other extreme. This is called directional selection. In directional selection, individuals at one end of the curve have higher fitness than individuals at the other end of the curve. Over time, that favored extreme will become more common. So for example, long tails on a lizard look like a snake and scares predators. The longer the tail, the more it looks like a snake. So the short tail is going to die off, the long tail is going to increase, and my graph is going to shift in one direction over. The next graph, we have our average. If I select against both extremes, those individuals are going to die off, which means the individuals in the center are going to keep surviving and reproducing. So my new population is going to be high in the average. So what I'm selecting for are the medium moderate traits. Those guys have a higher fitness. I'm selecting against both extremes. So overall, the curve becomes more narrow. This is called stabilizing selection. In stabilizing selection, Individuals near the center of the curve have a higher fitness than individuals at either end of the curve. So over time, the average states become more common. So looking at a cat, short tails mess up a cat's balance. They are going to die off. Long tails drag on the ground. They're going to die off. Medium tails are the best. They're going to survive. The next type of natural selection, I have my average. If I select against that average, which means the two extremes increase, it's going to look like this. So if I select against the extreme, the mean and for both extremes, so I'm selecting for both extremes and against the moderate traits. This type of selection lowers the fitness of the intermediate, that middle. In some cases, this can actually split the curve. So two distinct phenotypes are created, creating diversity within a species. This is called disruptive selection. In disruptive selection, individuals on the upper and lower ends of the curve have higher fitness than individuals in the middle. 
this causes a split within the species. So if I look at some squirrels, short tails keep predators from catching you on the ground. Long tails are good for balance in the trees. Medium tails don't help. This means that my fitness for short tails will increase, my fitness for long tails will increase, medium will not gather. Female robins can lay anywhere from one to 10 eggs. Laying too few eggs runs the risk of them all getting eaten and laying too many eggs result in underfed chicks. Most robins lay four to five eggs. I always start by labeling my axis. My Y axis is my dependent variable. It's what I count and I'm counting the number of individuals. My X axis is my independent variables and it's the variation. So on my X axis, I'm looking at the number of eggs and robins lay anywhere from zero to 10. That's my variation. Now I have to think who is being selected against? Who is not surviving? Too many eggs result in underfed chicks and too few eggs run the risk of them getting eaten. So too few are going down, too many are going down, which means that the ones that are surviving are the ones that lay the average four to five. And then all I do is draw a curve that matches these arrows going down on the sides and up in the middle. This type of selection, looking back at my notes, is stabilizing selection. Let's pause and practice the rest on our own. Thanks, Ghost Miss Judd. I was just sitting here thinking about how that was a lot of information, but it kind of makes sense for how the world looks. It makes sense for the environment to affect how populations look and act. You guys are awesome, and I'm so proud of you for all the work you put into these notes. As always, if you have questions, please ask your teacher and make some good choices. Mm -hmm.